It's always fun to be at GeoDesign. I was here four years ago and did a presentation which I started with some Ian McCarg. And uh, I think it's important this year in particular that it's the 50th anniversary of this book, Design with Nature. Um, with that book, also what came out, I brought you all a little gift of um, what was also created in the year uh, 1969 was this movie. I don't know if y'all saw it, it's called uh, Subdue, or Multiply and Subdue the Earth, which is actually a biblical quote. Um, and in the movie, um, we'll, we'll get a little visit here from Mr. McCarg. When there are 100 million more of us by the year 2000, will our cities be sicker still, our suburbs just as sick, our landscape father be foul? That's likely to be so, mate. And the reason is simple. We are a man-centered society. We have never learned that we are a part of nature. Show me any civilization that believes that reality exists only because man can perceive it, that the cosmos was erected to support man on its pinnacle, the man exclusively is divine, and then I will predict the nature of its cities and its landscape. The hot dog stands, the neon shill, the tiggy taggy houses, the sterile core, the mind and ravaged countryside. This is the image of anthropocentric man. So I have a question for you. We all lampoon this stuff. We lampoon the suburban sprawl. He did it. But has it really changed? Has it gotten any better? Has the ticky tackiness of this gone away? What are we missing in doing this analysis? And what we specialize in is understanding the biases that are baked in the system. What's going on inside public policy and how do we get our clients to see this? This is one of the things that primarily motivates us that the cities are essentially economic models and they're operating against their own economic interests. And Ian told us this. In his book, he said, economics is what drives people. Money is our measure. So why don't we talk about this? Why don't we bring this forward to our community so we can see how we're growing broke? And in fact, they actually ran it in one of his developments. Check this out. They actually did with math uh, the estimate value of good design. They did this without Excel. They did this without GIS. They ran the numbers. So what I found in a lot of our practice is a lot of us are just functionally illiterate in how our tax system operates. We're not reading the tax system to understand how it's driving our communities broke. And it's that simple. In fact, our cities are corporations. This is straight out of Oxford Dictionary. It says to constitute a company, a city, or other organization as a legal corporation. There is no difference between a real estate developer and a city. They're just large functioning op, uh, machines of, of, uh, of value. And it's not just your city, it's our counties, it's our state, it's our country. Did you know that uh, uh, on Stephen Colbert, Joe Biden said this, the United States is the largest corporation in the world. I'm such a nerd, I looked it up at midnight. There it is, if y'all want the code. We are a federal corporation. So if we don't understand the money motivation behind development patterns, we don't see how we're destroying the planet. In fact, my city of Asheville, North Carolina, is, is six times the value of Ted Turner. Do you think Ted Turner is going to make all of his decisions based on what's on Facebook? Of course not. He's looking at economic numbers. So why do we run our other corporations that way? So my city is a finite boundary of land that has to be managed. That land is incredibly valuable. That's the potency of what our community is. So we have to put value on that land. We have to show people why it's worth something. So land is a product, right? Our parent company did this, did this redevelopment of this building and made retail, office, and residential, right? Uh, so that by rehabbing this building that was worth $300,000, fixing it, it turned to $11 million. So do you all have a 401k plan that grows by 3,500%? That's the taxes that our community gets. And in our community, everybody's like, well, that's cool, Joe, that's great, that's $11 million. So we've got this Walmart over here at $20 million. Fair enough, double the value. But it took 34 acres to make that happen. It took 0.2 acres for that to happen. So on a per acre basis, this is the tax yield of our building versus that. This is the retail taxes. Would you rather have double the retail taxes? I mean, that's fair enough. That's what's going on here. Uh, residents, we got residents in our building. They don't. Jobs, we've got more jobs. So the data is there. We just have to show it to people. I was presenting this. I'll present that we're in California, so I might as well make it easy for you all. If you could grow something in California, what would you grow? Cash crop, right? So this isn't complex math that we're doing. This is actually a standard of economic analysis that used to be part of planning practices before World War II. 
Uh, we've done this all across the country. We've done about 60 different cities. And when we explain it to people, we say, this is an economic MRI. This is, if I can do a CAT scan on your brain and show your creative thought process versus your brainstem activity, why can't I show your economics? So back to Asheville. This is my county. This is typically how people look at my county. Non-taxable. This is a big park. No tax value. I don't care about it, right? Low value in green, high value in purple. This is the Biltmore Estate. It's worth $100 million. So that's really important, right? But it's kind of not fair, because it's, it's a 2,000-acre parcel, and it's a 180,000-square-foot house. It's the biggest house in America. So think of it as like the biggest gas tank. We don't gauge our cars on miles per tank, do we? So rather than saying total value, this is value per acre. OK, there's a map. Well, here's the same thing in 3D. Can you all tell me where downtown is? Boom. We can see the value of our downtown. We can also see the value of our little sister, Black Mountain and its urbanism. So we can see the form and the physical value of our communities writ large economically. Um, Minneapolis, Minnesota, this is Hennepin County. Guess where downtown is? This is actually kind of fun to do. There's several things that we learned about Minneapolis in doing this, this, this project, one of which was retail sales. This is a map of their retail sales. Uh, Josh McCarty, who's sitting over here, he was doing this. I'm like, hey, Josh, here's Mall of America. What's up with downtown? He's like, oh, it's up over here. So here's... <laughs> Here's downtown Minneapolis. This is Mall of America. So 100% retail environment, monolith right there, is one-tenth the productivity of downtown. Put it on a map and people understand it. Um, this was cool. This is taking all the buildings and throwing them away. This is just the dirt value productivity of Hennepin County. You notice some things that are going on by the lakes over here. So check this out. This is Wayzata. This is downtown. Look what happens when you privatize a piece of nature and only let the wealthy buy the edge of the lake versus letting a neighborhood access a park and all of the lakefront. You get the value dissipated into the neighborhood rather than the value for the few. We could show the value of nature in the models. The data is there. Um, Brevard, this is a little town in 12,000 people, uh, Western North Carolina. It's like, it's like Mayberry. Uh, we did their tax model. Guess where downtown is? Uh, Mayor Jimmy, when he saw this, he's like, well, that's cool. We're doing a stormwater model. Could you do the stormwater analysis? We're like, sure. So we, we made a monochrome of the, uh, of the tax productivity, and we dropped the stormwater on it and punched one through the other. So now we could see where you know, downtown's impervious, got it, so is the strip. So let's do a side view. These are mountain people, so they understand profiling. So here's, here's downtown, here's the stormwater, here's the difference. So we can see that downtown is, in fact, producing impervious, but it's also producing taxes where this, the strip isn't. It's financially upside down. So not all impervious surface is created equal. We have to look at it differently. That parking lot and that building are two different animals, although they're both impervious surfaces, right? Run the math on this stuff and do the model. Peoria, Illinois, this is kind of fun. They told us, they're like, oh, we've got a parking problem. We're like, all right, we can measure that. So here's their water, here's their green space, here's their streets and sidewalks, here's their surface parking, and here's their buildings. These are all structures. That's all parking. I told them, I'm like, look, y'all don't have a parking problem, you got a perception problem. This is the reality of your data. Is this too nerdy for you guys? Are you guys all right with this? Um, this is their, their buildings. When you look at it economically, buildings have value, parking has value. Buildings are pulling about 35 bucks a square foot of value. Parking's a buck, a buck 40 in value. The streets, inside, the streets, however, cost $9 in front of that and $9 in front of this. The streets don't care, right? So when did we all decide to give parking a, a 23 times subsidy? Do you all remember that meeting? Because that's what's going on. This is paying 23 times less taxes than that. The cost is the same. So when we look at the model, the reason why it drops off off downtown is because there's a choker collar of parking. When you look out at the burbs, and they're so flat, it's because we mandate parking out there. That's the reality of economic policies, right? So we did the whole county that way, and we're like, okay, here's the whole county's footprint. If you take all the buildings and sub them cheek to cheek, this is the size of the footprint that you need for an entire county's worth of buildings. That's it. And everybody's like, well, Joe, that's crazy. We don't want to be so close to each other. This is America, right? So. <laughs> We're going to stretch out. Well, when you stretch out, you need parking. That's all the parking in all of Peoria County, and here's your streets. So when we do the numbers, that's 8.6 square miles of buildings. You've got more land dedicated to parking, and this is your liability. This is everything else, berms, buffers, backyards, parks, farms, whatever. So here's the numbers. Let me do it on a per square mile basis, so it's apples to apples. 
you have a billion dollars of taxes coming off your buildings, you only have 40 million coming off your parking, and it's costing you $250 million an acre or a mile of, of roads. This is everything else. So you all get elected, you're running Peoria County. How are you going to finance yourself? What's paying for the cost of that? It certainly isn't this. That is called a subsidy, right? We're dipping into our money from our buildings to pay for that. That's why you don't have the money for the after-school program, the affordable housing, the, the art program. You don't have that money because we're spending it. Do you all follow me? Um, putting it on a map, this is how much roads Peoria has. It'll go from Peoria to Vancouver, British Columbia. Is this a sustainable model? So Jack said this a couple years ago, you know, if you put it on a map, people get it. When they saw that map of the streets, it drove the point home. So we, we do the map. Um, Palm Bay, Florida, Will's doing this one. We're actually going there next week. This is a city in a lot of problems. Uh, red are all the vacant parcels in the city. Um, green is agriculture. So when you do the numbers on it, this to me is a map, right? 16% of their city has streets, sidewalks, plumbing, and no buildings. That means it's not getting a lot of taxes. And everybody might look at this and go, this is cool, look at that, all this agriculture. Well, guess what? That's 40% of the city. And in Florida, there's this great economic policy where you can rent cows and put it on the land, and it gets this agricultural tax break. And Florida is just a, it's a placeholder for future sprawl. And they've essentially already undermined their community by allowing it to grow. That's spatial analysis. Lancaster, California, uh, just outside of Los Angeles, on the other side of the mountain, here's downtown. So they're up and over the mountain from Los Angeles. But check this out, they have 953 miles of road. Now, I don't know what that looks like, so we put it on a map. This is how much roads Lancaster has. Now, here's the crazy thing. This is when they were built. So their great-grandparents went on a road-building spree in the early 1900s, and everybody went to sleep. And you can't help but notice what happened after World War II when their grandparents woke up, and they did this. They built all of those miles of roads. Well, guess what? When your grandparents built those, those come back to haunt your parents' generation, and you have to rebuild those roads here. Well, guess what happens when you get hit with this huge capital bill for all of those roads? You go out and let out more development, more roads, right? That's how you pay for stuff. Well, guess what happens? This comes back and haunts you with the second rebuild, and it brings along with it this. So when you do a build-rebuild of all the roads, this is what it looks like. Do you all see a pattern? So that first wave was kind of silly. You go ahead and repeat it, and then it starts capitalizing on itself all under its own weight. This is the problem that American cities are dealing with right now. We've had a pattern that we weren't looking at and we weren't running the numbers on. This is the amount of roads they can afford, just looking at their current tax flow. That's it in green. Now, we'd be fools to say, just go ahead and cut off the red stuff, you can't afford it. That's the reality that they're dealing with. This is a habit that we've been in that Ian was waking us up to, and we failed to follow all of his lessons. We need to do the economics of this. Here, Redlands. We did Redlands. We asked people, we were like, hey, what's that thing? And everybody said, well, it's got to be the tallest building downtown. We're like, no, it's this. So this building is more productive than that. That's the reality of the math, right? This little guy, I love the uh, creatively titled shoe repair. There it is. Three acres of that little guy would equal the 13-acre Walmart. Um, if you take one block of downtown, it's like, what is that? Uh, one eighth, or eight, eight times the productivity of, of the Mountain Grove area, or you basically need that much of downtown to equal this. Now, let's say you need parking, Joe. You're not being fair. This is just urbanism. All right, we'll just double that, because that's the size of the parking garage next to that block. How we use the land has economic consequences. This is a shot down uh, what used to be part of downtown, right down the street here, about a mile away. And these buildings got torn down. This building got torn down. This used to be here in Redlands. Could you imagine what that'd be worth today? Well, here it is. Uh, this is what it's worth, half a million dollars an acre for that versus this. You had three presidents that slept there, and that building's gone. So uh, Josh was doing this model, and he's like, well, you got the mall downtown. What happened? So we went back in time, grabbed the, the, the Sandborn map from the, the Azri site. So these are all the buildings that were torn down. So uh, you know, Josh went into his, in his laboratory like Frankenstein made a monster, re recreated these buildings, regenerated them. So here's what the mall's doing right now. By the way, this is called foreshadowing right here. That's downtown. Um, here's what was torn away. 
So this community threw away $15 million of its own wealth. We can talk about building modern buildings in the downtown if we're not seeing the financial consequences of this. This is the loss of historic properties. To us, this is spatial analysis. We put it on a map. I kind of knew this joke would only work for some people in the audience, so it's, <laughs> but I did it anyway. So um, anyway, old buildings, Charleston. This is a uh, Charleston three-county area. And uh, you know, we told them, like, look, you didn't make the ocean. You can't claim its value, so we're going to go ahead and delete those. But this is what humans made. They have buildings that predate the Declaration of Independence, buildings that are older than the United States, things like this. This is the oldest liquor store in the entire United States, built in 1686. This is a revolutionary getting his drink on. These are all the buildings on a map. Here they are in plan. These buildings survived wars, hurricanes, fires, an earthquake. 21 acres of those buildings, this is what they paid in county taxes in 2015. They paid city taxes and downtown taxes on top of that. Out in the county, same county, there's a Walmart that's 21 acres, and this is what it paid the same year. Those buildings have produced 13 times the tax potency, and they've done so for 240 years. What kind of community wealth do you want to have? What kind of legacy do you want to leave for your kids? What's going on economically with our cities? Are we doing the math? You know, some people say to me, like, Joe, what's your problem, man? Why do you hate Walmart? And I'll, and I'll say to them, I, I presented the International Association of Tax Assessing Officers Conference, which uh, makes a planning conference feel like Burning Man by comparison. Um, <laughs> they're awesome people, but they're very rigorous about their math. This guy presented at 8 in the morning, and he presented spreadsheet after spreadsheet on how cheap Walmarts are. Think about that. You've got 3,000 assessors, you're getting all of your tax bills lowered in one meeting. That's efficient. So, trained as an architect, my heart's collapsing because I'm like, how is he getting away with this? So I walked up to the microphone and I asked him, I said, Mr. Terrell, what's the useful life of one of your buildings? And he immediately said, 15 years, maybe 20, we designed the building to depreciate it as quick as possible, build another one, start the depreciation cycle. We're building this to maximize our dollars. Right? Don't hate the player, hate the game. It's not their fault. They are showing us where the tax loopholes are. Close them. Make the choices in your community that benefit your community. If you want a 15-year relationship with the building, great. It's the life cycle of a cat. That's all you're going to get. <laughs> Make a conscious choice. Sorry to you cat people. We at least mourn the passing of the cat, right? Um, I'm a dog person. Lafayette, Louisiana, the, taking the deeper question of if we've got the money, where's it going? We did this, work, this project with Chuck Marone from Strong Towns. We love Chuck's work. We followed his thesis link the money to the, to the revenue, or the cost to the revenue source. Here's the revenue source. This is downtown, this is some new urbanism right here. They spread out into the swamps. Pavement. When I'm, when I'm a developer and I give you roads, they're a liability for you. So let's run the numbers on the six and a half square miles of roads that they own. How does that function in the city? Surprisingly, this was a reaction of city council. One of the councilors said this to me. It's not where you live, it's what you believe. What does that even mean? <laughs> and the public works director's response was this, there's no such thing as an infrastructure ferry, which is awesome. And so we photoshopped Kevin in on this one, and Kevin's like, just run the numbers. Like, all right, we'll do that. So this is the cost, the liability of all their roads, a billion dollars, that's the revenue they have to pay for that. So their liability is 18 times their revenue. Now here's the scary thing. They don't have the money, so what do they do? They go out and get a bond. Well, the bonding company has first right of refusal on their money. They've been skimming off the top. So you only have $25 million to pay for a billion. Do you understand why you're going broke? So taking the whole city and floating it in a lake, this is what it looks like. We sent everybody a bill for where they live, and this is the revenues that they're all paying. So we can see money coming in and money going out, netting one against the other, what's net positive, what's net negative. Here's the whole county in 3D you can see where you're bleeding your money. Taking this and dropping it on the floor so everything pops up vertical, this is what it looks like. If anybody's colorblind, here's the colorblind model. So we can say to them, this is all net positive. There are some incredibly poor neighborhoods in here that are net positive versus this stuff out here. And they told me, well, Joe, people really want to live out here. I'm like, yeah, hell yeah, that's what you're paying people to move out there. That's called a subsidy. And I don't care if you do it, just make sure you can afford it, right? Run the numbers, do the math. 
They had, in 1950, they had 33,000 people. This is the amount of feet of pipe per person they had. This is their fire hydrants per thousand. They grew their population to 121,000 people. This is their feet of pipe per person now. Their fire hydrants per thousand now. So they had a 350% growth in population, 1,000 and 2,000% growth in liability. Is this sustainable? They said to me, well, Joe, we got rich. We got, we got oil money out of the Gulf. We were like, oh, we'll measure that. So here's your household income. You actually grew your wealth, but only 160%. 160% growth in wealth, 1,000, 2,000% growth in liability. We call this geo-accounting. Your accountant doesn't care if you buy a boat, right? <laughs> your accountant cares if you can afford a boat. If you put the stuff on a map, people get it. These aren't invisible market forces that are making this happen. These are all driven to you by policy. And Moses didn't deliver your tax code. We can change these things. What's crazy is our country was formed on a tax revolt, and we don't understand this stuff. We're not doing the math on this stuff. Back to McCarg. Um, they closed the movie with this great little sequence here. It would be possible to store all the information in computers and ask the computer to find any city we dream of. To be able to ask it to find areas of inordinate beauty and intrinsic suitability for all the land uses that should compose the city. So thanks guys for making this software. It's awesome. We now have the computer software to do this. We put those numbers on a map. <laughs> and uh, don't worry about mistakes. And just do your math. Thank you. <laughs>